since we have a lot of guests who are not club members, let me just start with a little bit of history of the club. We were founded in 1916. And ever since then, we've been a home for musicians, poets, painters, sculptors, cartoonists, architects, and dancers, and maybe more importantly, the people who love them, which I think I fall in that category more than the actual arts category. In normal time, as Michael said, the club hosts concerts, contemporary dance performances, and poetry readings. We have a studio for painters and an art gallery. We award scholarships for aspiring collegiate artists. This year, Judith is the head of our scholarship committee and a literary reward for accomplished artists. But by now you're probably asking, what does all this have to do with James Monroe? Well, we had the good fortune when the club was founded to lease and then buy a federal era townhouse in DC's Foggy Bottom neighborhood that once upon a time was the home of James Monroe, who became our fifth president. So James Monroe, Monroe is near to our hearts and the club loves any excuse to celebrate him. That of course brings us to Tim McGrath, our guest speaker tonight. Tim has just published James Monroe, A Life uh, through Pe Penguin Random House. The scholarly biography has been hailed by Pulitzer Prize winning author John Meacham as, quote, a first rate account of a remarkable life, end quote. Having just finished this book, I heartily agree with this assessment and recommend it to you. Tim is a two time winner of the Commodore John Barry Book Award and is also the author of the critically acclaimed biography, John Barry, an American Hero in the Age of Sail. With that, let me turn it over to Tim to take it away. Thanks, Tim. Well, thank you, Martin. And I'd like to extend my thanks to Mr. Sinkowitz, the board chair for the Arts Club. It's great to see uh, you again, Judith. Uh, Judith Biggers Norton was a wonderful hostess when I came to visit and dig a little bit more into uh, the Arts Club and uh, Monroe's role in the house a few years back. And uh, a thanks to Martin and the uh, able and persistent help tonight of Sasha Sinclair, who uh, we've certainly put through the ringer for technical challenges tonight. My thanks to you all. And I wanna thank those of you who persisted in coming to attend this presentation. The first time I was called on to speak on behalf of an American president was 60 Octobers ago in 1960. Our fourth grade teacher, Mother Mary Rachel, decided that there would be a presidential debate followed by an election. My friend Fred, who was not only the smartest kid in the room, but the smartest kid in the world, would stand in for Vice President Nixon. To my immense delight, I was selected to speak for Senator John F. Kennedy. My hairline was much better then. With the nine-year-old's untrammeled zeal, I plunged into my part. It wasn't enough to rehash the Senator's phrase, that should get the country moving again. I needed to communicate fully about the recent recession, the missile gap with the Soviets, winning the space race, and the importance of the islands of Quimoy and Matsu. And I was pumped, so pumped in fact, that when a sixth grade girl told me that Nixon wants to send American kids to school on Saturdays, I dismissed it as hogwash and restudied Quimoya Matsu. By debate day, I was ready. But so was Fred, who I'm sure taught Bill Gates everything he knows. The recession could only be worsened, he remarked, by the Democratic Party's love of something called deficit spending. There was no missile gap. The space race would be won by our German rocket scientists and not their Russian counterparts. And it was paramount to realize the implications of Quimoy and Matsu by their longitudes and latitudes and their proximity to mainland Red China. Fred knew their longitudes and latitudes. Before an audience of 30 Roman Catholic children, Fred's Nixon was thrashing my Kennedy. Finally, Mother Rachel gave each of us 30 seconds to sum up, quoting Churchill, quoting Churchill, Fred reminded the class that a democracy like America's is poor government, but much better than a communist one. All I could reply to such wisdom was, if Mr. Nixon is elected, 
we will all go to school on Saturdays. When Mother Rachel asked where I obtained my information, I said from someone a lot older and smarter than myself, and Kennedy won the fourth grade election in a walk. The <laughs> following remarks are rooted in far more accurate documentation. James Monroe is the last of the fabled Virginia dynasty and the least well-known to the point of appearing an historical afterthought. All most Americans know about James Monroe is that his last name is on a doctrine, and even that is an enigma to most. At its 100th anniversary in 1823, historian David Yancey Thomas put it best, I only know two things about the Monroe Doctrine. One, that no American I have met knows what it is. The other is that no American I have met will consent to it being tampered with. There you have it. This painting you're seeing was done by Samuel F. B. Morse, who most of us only recall as the inventor of the telegraph. Of all the portraits of Monroe, including Gilbert Stuart's, this is the painting his family felt captured him best. And for me, they were absolutely right. It's anything but sedate, as portraits often are. Morse captured him perfectly. He almost looks as if he's standing in the wind. Those are eyes that don't miss anything capable of warmth and stubbornness, an almost hawk-like stare of obvious determination, his jaw firmly set, and his lips shut, but with enough of a turn at the corners to break into a grin that would reveal his innate optimism. For most historians, Monroe suffers in comparison to the other members of the Virginia dynasty. He was an officer, but not a general like Washington. He was a politician, but not as charismatic as Jefferson. Although a lawyer, he did not possess Madison's legal brilliance, but his physical courage certainly equaled Washington's. His willingness to adapt and adjust his political tenets allowed him to go beyond Jefferson in political thought, and his willingness to risk both his political career and his life in the bargain for James Madison's administration allowed him to help end a war Monroe had supported from the get-go and learned from its folly. From 1775 to 1825, James Monroe played a role during all the major events of America's first half century. It's a saga about rebellion, the unwieldy birth of a new government, a lifetime love affair with a remarkable woman, the dangers of a European revolution that coupled American ideals with mob rule and the guillotine, the joys, sorrows, and tragedies of parenthood, political intrigue that ranged from heated debate to pistols at 20 paces, diplomatic imbroglios, an unnecessary war, a post-war nation giddy with confidence. And throughout the tale, it is intertwined inextricably with slavery and racism. He was a physically imposing man, just over six feet, and he stayed lean and fit throughout his life. Like Washington, he was an accomplished horseman, Twice during the War of 1812, he led scouting parties from Washington, D.C. towards the Maryland coast when British warships approached the Chesapeake and the Patuxent. Those days of hard riding were hardly in the job description of Secretary of State or for a 56-year-old man. He held more public offices and positions than any president before him or since, rising from lieutenant to major in the Continental Army, serving as a lieutenant colonel in the Virginia militia. He was elected to the Virginia General Assembly at age 24, to the Confederation Congress at 25, to the United States Senate at 32. He served as minister to France and later Great Britain, four terms as governor of Virginia, secretary of state and secretary of war under James Madison, holding down both positions in the direst moments of the War of 1812. Early in his political career, he showed evidence of astute observation and sound decision-making. Disappointed that he was not selected as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, Monroe was chosen by Patrick Henry to be among the document's opponents at the Virginia Ratification Convention due to its lacking of Bill of Rights. He was particularly concerned about, in quotes, the responsibility of the president and the articles of impeachment. Would the president be tried, he asked, by his own counsel, by those who advise him to commit such crimes, this, Monroe declared, subverts the principles of justice. 
Furthermore, what was to prevent a foreign power using their arts and intrigues to corrupt his counselors, if not the president himself, he asked. And this is 200 years before Putin and McCartney wrote back in the USSR. The thought that a foreign power could hold such sway over a president haunted Monroe. His decisiveness can best be seen in his first year as governor when a yellow fever epidemic in Fredericksburg spread to Norfolk in the summer of 1800. Monroe had seen the tragic effect of yellow fever while a congressman in Philadelphia. To stop further spreading, Monroe declared an immediate quarantine of all vessels in Norfolk. Not even a canoe was allowed up the James River. And Monroe ordered that doctors examine everyone aboard the quarantined and still arriving ships and all to be cared for, as he put it, at public expense. He did not rescind his orders until the following November when the doctors assured him the crisis had passed. His relationship with four presidents who came before him are worth reviewing. Washington admired Monroe for his heroism, giving him a battlefield promotion after being seriously wounded at Trenton, and wrote a warm recommendation for him when Monroe asked permission to raise a regiment for the Virginia militia, calling him a brave, active, and sensible officer. But by the time Washington became president, Monroe's skills as a partisan leader had cooled his admiration. When it became obvious that Governor Morris, Washington's minister to France, had worn out his welcome and a new diplomat was needed, he named Monroe, but only after Madison and New Yorker Robert Livingston turned him down. Morris was no Francophile, Monroe was, and Washington needed a Republican minister as he was sending John Jay to London to work out a treaty that would surely shock and anger the French, America's first and most important ally. For three years, Monroe did his best to fulfill Washington's goal to strengthen our friendship with France. Monroe succeeded in winning back French favor, but when the Jay Treaty crossed the English Channel, the new French government saw Monroe as either naive or duplicitous. By this time, Washington had lost faith in Monroe and Monroe had lost faith in Washington. After he was recalled by John Adams, Monroe wrote a long response to Washington called a view of the conduct of the executive. It was a blistering accusation of duplicity by Washington, ignoring the fact that Monroe too had been duplicitous, sending reports to Madison and other Republican allies about the French reaction over Jay's treaty and Monroe's own resentment of his treatment by Washington and later John Adams cabinet members. Monroe nurtured his grudge until he was elected governor of Virginia in December 1799, when he wrote Madison that he intended to reach out to Washington to see if they could reconcile their differences. Days later, after riding about Mount Vernon during a harsh storm, Washington came inside Mount Vernon, soaked and chilled to the bone. He asked his amanuensis, Tobias Lear, to read the newspapers to him. After Lear mentioned Monroe's election to the governorship, Washington became so agitated that Lear suggested he go to bed. Washington died the next day. 23 years had passed since that bitter snowy night when the young lieutenant crossed the Delaware ahead of his general, both united by the same desire, a country of their own. In the end, partisan politics created a river too icy for either of them to cross. As I said, it was President John Adams, not Washington, who recalled Monroe from Paris and later called him in public the disgraced minister. In the spring of 1800, Adams informed Governor Monroe of his intention to visit Virginia. A presidential visit usually required a personal welcome by the state governor. Monroe was not so inclined. Any attention from me to you, he wrote Adams, would be highly improper and Adams knew why. He did not come to Virginia. But 11 years later, a retired and mellowed Adams sent congratulations to Monroe when Madison made him Secretary of State. Monroe responded in kind, wishing Adams all the satisfaction and happiness that Adams had merited in his long career. But my favorite Adams correspondence is not between James and John or even John Quincy, Monroe's Secretary of State. It is between James and Abigail Adams. When the War of 1812 broke out, she and her husband grew concerned that they may not survive to see their son Quincy again. 
then minister to Russia. Her letter to Secretary of State Monroe, asking whether any method of possibility may devise for him and his family to get back to America with safety during the war and come back to us, is a wondrous combination of New England per pertinence and a mother's heartsick anxiety. Monroe responded with his own empathetic sincerity. While, as he put it, it is impossible to state the precise time when your son will return, he promised Abigail that every facility which the government can allow will be extended to him. Years later, during Monroe's celebrated tour of the Northern United States, he spent a wondrous day at the Adams Farm Peace Field. And days later, Abigail received a letter telling her that Quincy was sailing home to serve as Monroe's Secretary of State. <clears throat> For nearly 50 years, Thomas Jefferson served as Monroe's mentor, law professor, counselor, and role model. Now I'm taking a break from text here since we're talking at the Arts Club. For those of you who don't know it, this is a portrait of Jefferson by Jamie Wyeth. And I don't think anyone captured Jefferson better than that. I mean, just look at that painting, just the, the colors, the fact that the hair is not so pulled back. Um, there's a casualness to how he's sitting and how he's wearing, but at the same time, you just can tell this is this this person is just you know uh, someone to be reckoned with and to be admired in a great many ways. Although that seems to be changing a good bit as we confront more and more of the issue of race. Jefferson saw a great promise in Monroe: turn his wrong his soul wrong side outwards, and there is not a speck on it. He wrote to Madison. Monroe became a willing acolyte serving him as a reliable officer and courier during the revolution, sharing living quarters with him in Annapolis during one congressional session, being his eyes and ears in the Confederation Congress while Jefferson was minister to France and later returning to France himself at President Jefferson's request to close a real estate deal we call the Louisiana Purchase. 15 years later, after Washington was burned by the British and Monroe was scrambling to fulfill two cabinet responsibilities, he poured out his troubles to Jefferson, adding his intention to adopt almost any plan to keep the government financially afloat and add manpower to a standing army, an abandonment of the agrarian idealism they both loved for pragmatic approaches to keep from losing the war. Jefferson warned him that were an angel from heaven to undertake your challenges, all our miscarriages would be ascribed to him. But Monroe's mind was set. From this point on, he continued to seek Jefferson's opinion and advice, but would not always take it. His relationship with Madison was the longest and in many ways, the deepest of his career. They were rivals during the Virginia Convention to ratify the Constitution and are the only two presidents who opposed each other for a congressional seat, once having a debate outside a Presbyterian church during a blizzard because the minister thought politics didn't belong inside a house of worship, an early example of the separation of church and state that resulted in Madison's nose becoming frostbit. After settling in Virginia upon Eliza's birth, the Monroes asked Madison back in New York to shop for their furniture. Brilliant as he was, the bachelor Madison was an abject failure with housewares. Elizabeth's sister Maria called his purchases vile, just one word, vile. As a homemaker, Madison proved to be one hell of a legislator. Years later, when the Monroes were in Paris and Madison had married Dolly, he made the same request of the Monroes, not so slyly suggesting that Elizabeth make the furniture purchases. As with Washington, Monroe had a falling out with both Jefferson and Madison. Monroe led negotiations in London for a treaty that would improve relations with the British, but both President Jefferson and Secretary of State Madison would not even present it to Congress. Monroe's resentment at Jefferson soon subsided. Who could stay angry with Jefferson? But he remained embittered at Madison. They did not communicate for two years until Madison, now president, wrote Monroe, asking him to recommend a gardener for Montpelier, accompanied by his and Dolly's best wishes to Elizabeth and Monroe's family. The ice was broken and within months, 
Monroe became Madison's Secretary of State. Leave it to the shy and sly Madison to replant a friendship with a letter about a gardener. Her favorite story about the two occurred many years later when both men were ex-presidents. Jefferson had recently died and both were now on the University of Virginia Board of Governors. One observer delighted in watching these two old men and old friends and former rivals indulge in the humorous jest and merry laugh as if young again, as he put it. After one session, they took a break to walk their old friend's estate. Somehow, somewhere, Madison lost his shoe buckles on some muddy embankment. Once back home, Monroe sent Madison the buckles to repair the loss you sustained in our interesting walk at Monticello. Boys will be boys, and when given the opportunity, old men will be boys too. As a young man, Monroe possessed what Jefferson called an exive inflammability of temper. He came perilously close to fighting a duel with Alexander Hamilton. In the last days of his presidency, he brandished fireplace tongs to defend himself against his cane-wielding treasury secretary. Monroe had a keen intellect, but when your two best friends are Jefferson and Madison, it's not likely you'll be considered the brightest man in the room. But Monroe was wise, wiser than both of them. Once when the three men had gathered at Monticello, another guest of Jefferson summed their talents up quite accurately. Jefferson, he declared, has the most learning. Madison, the most brilliancy, and Monroe, the most judgment. But it is Monroe's working relationship with John Quincy Adams that best shows us Monroe's foresight and leadership skills. At cabinet meetings, Monroe kept separate sheets of paper for each issue he wished to discuss. Adams called them his Sibylline leaves. In fact, Monroe's cabinet rivals Washington's or any other's presidents for talent. Among those at the table were Secretary of Treasury William Crawford, whose financial skills were sound, although his loyalty was to Crawford and not to his president. Young John Calhoun, Secretary of War, not yet slavery's avatar, whose organizational skills came in handy in reorganizing the army. And Adams, who had been a U.S. diplomat since his teenage years. Monroe spent most of the time picking his team's brains asking questions and rarely giving his opinion until the sessions were well underway. Adams at first noticed the slowness and want of decision in Monroe, but soon admitted in his diary he was wrong. He soon developed profound respect for Monroe's always deliberate and always sincere decisions, but it was Calhoun who best summed up Monroe's approach. Give him time, Calhoun remarked, and he was a man of the best judgment I have ever known. The most surprising feature of Monroe's political life comes when he assumes the presidency. In the House and Senate, Monroe was the most partisan of politicians. Even the Federalists grudgingly admired his infighting skills. At times, he was more of a Jeffersonian than, well, Jefferson. But once president, however, he abandoned his party biases. And for those of you who don't know it, this bar relief is in the back wall, I believe, at the Arts Club of D.C., Washington's death robbed him from a rapprochement with his commander in chief, but now he became his Monroe's spiritual role model. He assimilated Federalist ideas, such as a national bank, if not Federalist leaders. And like Washington, he knew the importance of imagery. On his extensive tours of the United States, the first by a president since Washington, he wore a blue jacket with buff waistcoat and breeches, along with a chapeau bra hat. It was the closest he could get to the Continental Army uniform he proudly wore 40 years earlier. In great cities, small towns, and quaint villages, Monroe's arrivals guaranteed bands, military honors, and fireworks. Silhouetted against the afternoon sun, he reminded citizens of their husband, father, brother, or old comrade in arms. Monroe's outfit was no accident. And it was a Federalist newspaper, Boston's Columbian Sentinel, that gave his presidency the nickname still used today, the Era of Good Feelings. Monroe had easily defeated Federalist Rufus King in 1816. Despite the Panic of 1819, which, revived, which rivals the Great Depression for its economic impact on the United States, and the very real threat of secession, 
during the admission of Missouri to the Union before the famous compromise was reached and which Monroe played a not so secret role in resolving using the back door of the White House and his political skills similar to FDR's or Lyndon Johnson's. Monroe ran virtually unopposed in 1820, winning every electoral vote but one that year. Legend has it that one voter believed that only Washington deserved a unanimous electoral vote. But the truth is that William Plumer of New Hampshire believed Monroe lacked, as he put it, weight of character. In his eight years as president, Monroe had his share of accomplishments, among them the acquisition of Florida, increasing the size of the Army and Navy, and building more forts along the coast to deter another invasion after the War of 1812. His hopes of building interstate roadways and canals were hampered by his own interpretation of the Constitution and Congressman's refusal to his request to amend it. But his principal shortcomings came from the country's most vexing issue, which were not considered anything at all at that, at that time. And those are issues of race. From his early days as a Confederation Congressman, Monroe sought a successful policy of peaceful coexistence with the Native American nations. On a journey through the Northwest Territory he undertook in 1784, he befriended Joseph Brandt, the Mohawk chief who led his warriors along with the British against the Americans from New York to Detroit. Brandt now sought a fair deal for his people with the Americans and he and Monroe immediately struck up a friendship. Weeks later, when Monroe returned, negotiations with other congressmen broke down and a frustrated Brandt wrote Monroe, the Mohawks he declared war, as he put it, no double faces at war or in any other business. Monroe urged Brandt to come to Congress and state his case, promising him he would be treated fairly. As he wrote this though, another treaty was made without Brandt or Monroe's involvement, where other Native American leaders ceded New York and much of Ohio to the American government for white settlement, the very lands Brandt was trying to save. Throughout his career, including his presidency, Monroe advocated the benign approach of education and assimilation. That Native American chief in the front of this uh, portrait is wearing a gold medal with Monroe's uh, image on it. Monroe delighted in visiting schools, mostly faith-based on Native American lands, believing this was the best solution between the two races. No tribe adapted to his urgings more than the Cherokee. When Georgia's governor and congressman demanded that Monroe support their plans to relocate the tribe out of Georgia, he defied them. An attempt to remove the Cherokee would, in my opinion, he declared, unjust, but Monroe could neither move the Cherokee nor protect them. John Quincy Adams maintained Monroe's unwieldy balancing act. Andrew Jackson did otherwise. 12 of the first 14 presidents were slaveholders. Only John and John Quincy Adams were not. Monroe considered himself a benign master, writing and speaking about the evils of slavery. One of his purchases was from Jefferson, Sally Hemings' sister, Thania. When she died, the Monroes mourned her loss. As president, Monroe enthusiastically sent the U.S. Navy to the Atlantic and Caribbean to hunt down slavers and slave trading slip ships and proudly mentioned the Navy's successes in his annual message to Congress, what we now call the State of the Union. He was a founding member of the American Colonization Society and was honored that they named Liberia's capital, Monrovia, after him. He once took a relative of Jefferson's to court over the beating of an enslaved man, stating that the God who made us made the black people and they ought not to be treated with barbarity. As governor of Virginia, he was compelled to execute the leaders of Gabriel's rebellion, which prompted serious soul searching on Monroe's part. Hanging rebellious enslaved men for doing exactly what he had done years before, fighting for liberty, aided Monroe. Where to arrest the hand of the executioner, he asked Jefferson. But for the rest of his life, Monroe sought a solution to slavery that was morally, politically, and financially agreeable to him and the other slaveholders. 
he never found it. Given his point of view and the times he lived in, he never could have. Monroe did free one enslaved man right before he died. If you ask Monroe which of his many titles was dearest to his heart, he would have said husband and father. He and his wife had three children, two daughters, Eliza shown here and Mariah, and a son, James, who died when he was one years old during Gabriel's rebellion. The oldest, Eliza, accompanied her parents to Paris in 1794 and was educated by Madame Jean-Louise Henriette Campan, a former lady-in-waiting for Marie Antoinette, who was probably spared the guillotine because she was Citizen Genet's sister. Madame Campan taught both schooling and aristocratic behavior. Eliza took to both eagerly and soon became what we would call a snob. At Madame's school, she met her lifelong friend, Latence de Beauharnais, whose mother Josephine was currently mistress to a young ambitious officer, Napoleon Bonaparte. As an adult, Eliza's innate talent for putting on airs did little to warm Washington society to her and often caused thanks with her parents. No reputation, John Quincy Adams believed, is safe in her hands. Yet she was capable of exceptional kindnesses. When the infant daughter of John C. Calhoun was deathly ill, Eliza visited every day, just one example of her well-hidden, better side. One DC socialite later commented that Eliza was the best nurse in the world. Her husband, attorney George Hay, became one of her father's closest advisors. The youngest daughter, Mariah, was a playful child and much more endearing than her sister. Her marriage to her cousin Samuel Gouverneur was the first White House wedding, which, thanks to Eliza, caused a storm of controversy when Eliza considerably restricted the guest list. Sam Gouverneur lacked his brother-in-law's influence with the president, but Monroe found him a reliable assistant. While serving in Congress, when New York City was the federal capital, Monroe met Elizabeth Courtright. Hers was one of the most prominent families in both New York's business and society circles. Elizabeth and her three sisters rivaled the Schuyler sisters in popularity, looks, and education, and would be equally well known had Lynn Manuel Miranda made Monroe his subject and not Hamilton. One congressman recalled the Courtright sisters making such a brilliant, lovely, and appearance at a theater one night as to depopulate all the other boxes of all the genteel male people therein. To Monroe's friends, Elizabeth resembled a young goddess, and it's easy to see why. Throughout his youth, Monroe had pursued the ladies with a shy earnestness that often led to disappointing results. In fact, Elizabeth's friends considered the land poor Monroe beneath her. They were married at her stately home called the Sycamore in February 1786. James was 27, Elizabeth 17. She bore the role of a politician's wife with exceptional dignity and class. Here's three stories I love about her. The first occurred when Elizabeth was expecting their first child. Congress had just adjourned and Monroe had bought a chariot, a two horse carriage with a coach box for Monroe to sit on as he drove the two horses and a cushioned back seat for no more than two passengers. To keep her company, the bachelor James Madison hitched a ride. Madison's voice was as small as he was, but he could be loud when necessary. But his conversations were almost totally about politics. As he and Monroe shouted over the clip-clop of horses hooves about this issue or that colleague, Elizabeth, now pregnant, gamefully bore the endless rides over rutted dirt roads and the bare bones amenities of roadside taverns and inns, hardly a match for their comfort of her home. No one was more grateful when Monroe turned up the road to Mount Vernon to pay a respectful visit to George Washington, who had a well-deserved reputation as a gracious host. He immediately saw to it that Elizabeth received every creature comfort she needed, particularly a bath, a fine meal, a comfortable bed, and privacy. And I would point out that when they came to visit, Martha Washington is away at the time. So that's one more for George. Another incident came in 1824, the last full year of Monroe's presidency. By this time, Elizabeth had long suffered from seizures and illnesses. Her older daughter, Eliza, often substituted for her as hostess during formal affairs. The era of good feelings was now ancient history. 
as no less than five serious presidential candidates arose, three from Monroe's cabinet. Various congressional supporters, particularly William Crawford's, looked for any chance to embarrass Monroe, launching investigations into both his political appointments and his finances. A major cultural event was to be held in April. The first Unitarian Church was hosting an oratorio. All of Washington society would attend, but gossip mongers assumed the Monroes would not. They did, coming as much to silence, <clears throat> excuse me, wagging tongues as to hear the performance. Though seriously ill, Elizabeth Monroe had lost neither her dignity nor her steely resolve. Her courage, though, is best shown in Paris when she was all of 25 years old. Among the victims of the reign of terror when the Monroes arrived in 1794 was Adrienne Lafayette, wife of Monroe's old war comrade, the Marquis, himself languishing in an Austrian prison. Adrienne's mother, grandmother, and sister were all beheaded by Robespierre five days before he himself met Madame Guillotine. Because there were more prisoners than cells, Adrian was incarcerated at the 400-year-old Plessy prison. That might be the next one there, uh, Sasha. You might have flipped them. There we, nope, I guess it's not there. We'll live without it. Uh, nope, you might as well go back, sorry. Because there were more prisons than cells, prisoners than cells, Adrian was incarcerated at the 400-year-old Plessy prison, once a stately hotel. As minister, Monroe was confined by diplomatic encumbrances that prevented any direction on his part. But if her husband could not visit Adrienne, Elizabeth would. One late autumn morning, wearing one of her finer dresses, topped with a warm cloak to offset the morning chill, she climbed into their carriage, cleaned and polished, and had herself driven the mile and a half from their home to Plessy Prison, passing the expansive estates and then the narrow Parisian streets lined with tenements, wine and barber shops, and the occasional brothel. When the coachman stopped at the entrance, a crowd converged and Elizabeth stepped out and walked straight to the gate, announcing who she was and the reason for her visit. Hearing the jailer's boots coming up the stairs, Adrienne panicked, believing the executioner had come for her at last. Instead, there was a tearful, heartwarming meeting between the two women, the start of the Monroe's campaign to successfully have Adrienne freed. Finally, as we see here, a word of the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe was known for taking his time in resolving an issue. When it came to the recognition of the new republics in South America, spearheaded by Simon Bolivar, Bernardo O'Higgins, and others, Monroe was chastised by Speaker of the House Henry Clay for his lack of action. But as always for Monroe, it was a matter of timing, and by 1823, he believed the moment was at hand. His declaration that European powers could no longer establish colonies in the Western Hemisphere was both a sign of growing strength of the United States and the knowledge that the British Navy, then the most powerful instrument of might in the world, would back America up. Scholars have long debated whether the Monroe Doctrine was his idea or that of John Quincy Adams. It is actually the perfect union of their ideas, as well as in others. As historian and Monroe expert Scott Harris says, George Washington was not in the room where the Monroe Doctrine happened, but his policy of neutrality was certainly a strong influence. Two centuries later, the Monroe Doctrine can be seen as the third document from the founders that states American ideals for its government and citizens to live by. Jefferson's comment about it says it best. This, he happily told Monroe, sets our compass. The man who had fought for and served his country on two continents died in a small bedroom at his daughter Mariah's New York City home on the 4th of July, 1831. All of America mourned. His funeral was the largest yet seen in New York. But of all the eulogies and tributes, the best came from John Quincy Adams. If any parent has a child of ardent mind and panting for honorable, dis dis uh, honorable distinction, Adam's solution was simple. Point him, he ended, to James Monroe. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Thanks, where Peter. can, where, because of 
COVID, obviously you're not signing books. Where can we get the book? Obviously through Amazon, I believe Politics and Prose is carrying it, the Barnes and Nobles uh, have it. And uh, uh, if Martin wants to make, or Sasha wants to make my email address available, if anybody's looking for it to be signed, they can send me their name and address. And I've been sending out book plates because of the COVID. So and all they have to tell me is how they want it made out to, and it's something that they can pop in the book. Thanks for asking that, Judith. I, well, thank you for coming. My pleasure. With a small group of people, but everybody who is a, even vaguely a part of the Arts Club should have been here tonight, or at least they should have access to the book. So we'll get one for our library as well. I have a question. Yes. Uh, can you tell us any uh, little anecdotes you picked up about his time at the at the Arts Club building, which is which was his home? I was hoping somebody would ask yeah, that. For those okay. of you who aren't familiar, the home's on I Street, and it was where Monroe and his wife and family lived while he was Secretary of State. And. Uh, the Monroes and Madisons were, were very close friends, except during a falling out at one point. Uh, they shared everything together. But how would you like to follow Dolly Madison as First Lady? Um, she probably will always be the most popular woman that, uh, of her, certainly of her age, although I believe Michelle Obama is going to give her quite a run for her money. Uh, but, you know, uh, Madison's rival for the presidency uh, once commented to his friends that he thought he could beat James Madison, but knew he couldn't beat Dolly. Uh, the Madisons had weekly dinners at what was then called the president's house or the president's mansion um, that were very boisterous affairs accompanied by music, including Dolly's guitar playing. But uh, while Elizabeth was quite uh, a pianist, she was a bit more reserved. If there's a first lady that resembles her, it's probably Jacqueline Kennedy Arnassus. They both were very beautiful. They both were very talented and uh, they both kept their distance and they both were very brave. Uh, obviously Elizabeth on her visit to Adrienne Lafayette and Mrs. Onassis after the numbingly tragic days after her husband's assassination. But the I Street House figures in two stories that I like. One is that the Monroes decided to adapt the Madison's dinners when it was time to start unofficially running for president. But they were not the full boisterous affairs that the Madisons had. They were more reflective of European gentility and that old fashioned sense of manners um, that uh, Elizabeth was much more at home with. So they would be more inclined to be a state dinner of maybe 15 to 20 people than filling up the whole house. Another thing I found interesting is that uh, when Monroe was inaugurated, uh, the White House was certainly not yet finished and people came back to the house. And uh, one uh, socialite wrote that uh, election night when the Monroes had left the hotel in their ball, uh, they could not, uh, they finally had to say, please go home. Uh, the arts club was so full that, El that Elizabeth was literally wedged in the staircase coming up and down from the crowds and uh, that everyone uh, had to be there and be present to congratulate them. So those are the two stories I know best about how they use the house. And would it be accurate to say that the, the front parlor of the second floor of the, of, of the, uh, of, of the uh, current, current building. Yes. Yep. Was that the focus of where all the activity I happened? believe so, yes. I, 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 that's, that's how it was explained to me. Judith would probably know better than me. When I was there, I drew, I drew kind of a blueprint of what was, what was there when they were there. And I would think that's accurate. So, you know, when people come in and are looking at the latest artwork or to see a musical performance uh, at any time, they're certainly stepping on some of the same boards and everything else that the Monroe's had. Tim, uh, Tim I'm, I'm yeah. uh, Bill Turner, uh, club member. Uh, clearly, you've 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 had to do a lot of uh, research 
to, to, to write this book. What was your greatest challenge in researching it? And wh where did you do your research? Library of Congress or what, what kinds of libraries, re research That's resources a, did you a use? Great, a great question. When uh, Brent Howard, uh, who is a very intrepid editor at Penguin, has done uh, the last two books, uh, suggested we do a presidential biography. Monroe's name came up because when I was seven, he became my favorite president. I had visited Valley Forge, which is not too far from here. And the uh, park guard talked about how Monroe was in the same regiment and perhaps the same log cabin as an old schoolmate of his, John Marshall, who became, as we all know, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Marshall was a couple of years older, but they both were in the 3rd Virginia Regiment. So I had that image in my head, which of course proved to be untrue. Monroe became an aide to Lord Sterling. So he spent Valley Forge in the more comfortable confines of a stone house that still exists up there. We got to go through it. Um, but research for Monroe, I was wonderfully helped. Bruce Kirby at the Library of Congress, close to uh, where you guys are, is, has been a help for all three books. And I got to meet and befriend and admire uh, the staff at three different places in Virginia. Uh, the James Monroe Museum, uh, which is ably run uh, uh, with the other museums by Scott Harris, who is a remarkable historian in his own right and a great guy. Um, Dan Preston, who just retired from University of Mary Washington and handed over to Bob Karachek and also a lot of work by Heidi Stello at the University of Mary Washington which is putting together the volumes of Monroe's papers. And uh, Sarah Bon Harper, the executive director at Monroe's estate in Charlottesville Highland, who, uh, two things about her. She has, she was determined that the small house on the grounds uh, was not the house Monroe lived in. I was a little bit disappointed because it, it looks exactly like the cottage my wife and I have in Stone Harbor, New Jersey, just with better furniture. Um, but she did find the foundation of a 40 by 70 foot house. And nobody knows, it, it was obviously burned. Nobody knows when, there's no documentation about why, but that would be Monroe's real home. And this was probably the guest house. Um, as far as you know, the, the research or other places from the New York Public Library and Historical Society, um, you can't do a book about that era without thanking God that John Quincy Adams kept diaries because so much of everything else would be left to conjecture and he didn't miss a beat. You have the issue where he's, it's coming from his point of view, but man, they're just phenomenal. And uh, Catherine Algor uh, is now uh, the uh, CEO of the Massachusetts Hist Historical Society. She wrote three books about Dolly Madison that you cannot read without falling in love with Dolly Madison. And I was ably helped up there by Dan Hinchin uh, on the last two books. But, and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania uh, has a plethora of Monroe's documentation. And they're also the one that just two years ago, uh, the folks at Mon uh, Monticello and at Highland discovered this document that Monroe literally freed an enslaved man on his deathbed in New York, a man named Peter Marks. And I was upset because I said, I've been coming here every Wednesday night. How did I miss this? But it had been misfiled. And uh, somebody found it and, and it, it makes for, or adds to the real story of it. I will say this. Um, We did pick a new, another book to work on, but I made a, I swore to myself that I would never again volunteer to just do a story about someone if their handwriting is worse than mine. And James Monroe's handwriting is worse than mine. It's terrible. There are times you're looking at it almost like cross-eyed. I hand it to Scott, I handed it to Dan, I'd hand it to, what do you think of all this? And, uh, and they're, you know, I can't, you know, so you really have to be, quite persistent to get into understanding his, his handwriting. Uh, I forgot my story about Sarah, uh, who's been just as all of them, very terrific. And she's also putting together a program bringing in the descendants of Monroe's enslaved uh, 
uh, individuals uh, to having conversations uh, at Highland. But I, uh, when I found out Sarah was not only a historian, but also an archeologist, we got into talking about, and I asked her how she met her husband, also an archeologist. And she said, we literally met bumping heads. And I said, oh, where was that? Thinking it would be some dig in Virginia or maybe upstate New York or something. And she said, Pompeii. And oh, of course, that's where two archeologists are gonna bump heads and get married, Pompeii. But uh, that's a good question. But there's his his papers are all over the place. But the those four I first mentioned really had the bulk of them. Tim, I just want to mention parenthetically. You mentioned John Quincy Adams. Well, his son Charles Francis Adams ended up living at the what we call the Monroe House, now the Arts Club of Washington. The other thing I wanted to ask about was his daughter uh, Eliza and and where she ended up. Um. Oh, you're 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 uh, you're pulling your punches, pal. We discussed this. Uh, Eliza, uh, you, you, as, as much as she was a bit of a jerk, you have to feel sorry for her, and that within the span of a month, she lost both her husband and her mother, and then nine months later, her dad. Uh, she returned to France. She loved France, and uh, uh, wound up going into a convent and she is buried at the same cemetery uh, with quite a few other uh, people of artistic bent, including Moliere and Jim Morrison of the Doors. Um, I found one of the things uh, so ironic when you put everything together, which makes history more fun than fiction, is that her best friend Hortense's son became Napoleon III. And her best friend's son provided the first real challenge to her father's doctrine about European intervention in America. It was under his regime that Emperor Maximilian and Empress Carlotta came over for the French to set up a colony in Mexico while the Civil War raged. And I was like, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Somebody you. has a uh, question, I think, in the chat. Let's just see. Okay. Do you see it there, Sasha? Yes, it says, I'll read it real quick. Okay, the front door slash entrance and a party was whisked away during the War of 1812. Any oh, insights? Yeah. There's a story about, uh, and the Arts Club talks about a uh, some kind of a meeting in, uh, in the Monroe House during the War of 1812 where uh, was it President Madison who ended up riding through the front doors at Am I telling the story right, Judith? Yeah. I think on a horse, right? On a horse. And it, uh, it, we no. all think it's apocrypha, but is we there are. any any possibility that it might be true? <laughs> nothing that I, nothing I turned up. I'll leave it, I'll leave it to Judith if she knows better. No, it's, this is all hearsay, but the story is that um, James Monroe and Elizabeth and Dolly Madison were in the courtyard in the back of the house. And James Madison came through on a horse because they needed to leave right away. And so it was faster. He rode through the front of the house to the back to gather them up. That's, that's all I know. That could be apocryphal because Dolly had left before Madison got back to DC and uh, he and, and, and Monroe. And then uh, Monroe was one of the last people to leave Washington. He left just as the British skirmish line was coming in. Um, but uh, he wound up that night staying at the same estate where Dolly Madison was. And uh, the hostess, a friend of both of them, was very worried that it was close enough that the British troops would come by and, and Monroe knew better. And he said, Madam, you are as safe here as if you would be if, as if you were in the Alleghenies. And then after three days of riding back and forth across Maryland and, and what he just went through that day, uh, promptly fell asleep. Tim, I, I wanted to ask you before you end about your, your next project. Thank you. Um, we are embarking on a book, uh, both uh, Jim Donovan, my agent, who's a heck of a writer on his own. He's written terrific works on Custer's Last Stand in the Alamo. A bunch of us said, what's next, Thermopylae or the Titanic or Donner Pass? And he wrote a tremendous book on the uh, Apollo 11. Uh, 
and he's currently working on a book on D-Day. But uh, they suggested uh, doing a book on George Meade. And the more I looked into it, I was eh, I'm not too sure. <clears throat> and I suggested maybe a book, uh, that we're, which is what we're doing, is a book on Lincoln, Meade, and Lee, and the decisions that they made right before, during, and after the Battle of Gettysburg and the ramifications of those decisions. But it will be a good bit on Meade, who uh, uh, what knocked me out when I kept, I don't remember ever reading this about him being a history major, and uh, is that in between the Mexican War and the Civil War, Meade is an engineer from New England down to Florida, designed and built lighthouses several of which are still in existence today, including Cape May and the one up at Barnegat. The Barnegat one's no longer in use, but it's a museum. And I thought, you know, here's a guy who's going to be in charge of the most cataclysmic battle on the, you know, American continent and uh, who knows the importance of ground because he was a lighthouse builder. You know, you, and again, just something that is a, is a fascinating sidelight to, to what people did. I think I may have mentioned to you, Tim, that we have a connection at the Arts Club to the Gettysburg because of our first founding president was the sculptor of the Lincoln bust at the Gettysburg Cemetery. Cemetery. And I think he also may have done the equestrian statue of Meade that's there. I'm not certain of that. I think you're right. I think you're right. Well, are there any other questions for Tim before we let him go? If not, I think we should all wave our hands and uh, congratulations so for everything. Thank, thank you all so very, very much. This was a ton of fun and, and a wonderful chance to get to see you again, Judith, and, uh, and play a part. You guys certainly were immeasurably helpful to me with uh, being able to get this story right. And I will always be grateful to you for doing that. Well, it's nice to have us get the story right, too, because everything we know has been hearsay for the most part. Um, <laughs> we're somehow anecdotal. Anyway, thank you so yeah. much.